Good afternoon, viewers. Welcome to this afternoon session of EduSet. Today we are going to speak on the topic of link between forest resources and people. And uh, to explain to you this concept and the whole uh, idea about how forest is uh, a resource on which people are dependent for their livelihood for many other products for which uh, we are many times not even aware that we are dependent on the forest. So we have with us in our studio Professor Shobita Jain, retired faculty from sociology, IGNU, and she is the one who initiated this program and has been the architect of the program in many ways. She had coordinated this course uh, before and uh, she is going to speak to you about this topic. And let us ask her certain questions which are very pertinent to this topic. First, I request her to ask, uh, answer the question about what is exactly meant by forest resources. Thank you, Arjuna. That we are today on the topic of forest resources and its link with people. And before going into the details of this particular link, let us look at our day-to-day -day life, where I cannot think of a situation in which there is no link with forest resources. Here we are sitting in the studio, which is definitely a high technology product, but around me there are so many things which have come from the forest. The chair I am sitting on, its arms are made of wood. And where do we get the wood from? Directly from the forest. So as Archana said, very truly, we are not even aware of this link, directly or indirectly. We have close connection with forest, its products and that is what we call forest resources and happily enough forest resources are one of those resources which we can renew and we can depend on these resources if we have the will to renew them and look after them and make them sustainable for ourselves and in that very sense we do want to talk about the link. Now to come to Archana's question. What are these resources? It's not just the trees that you see in the forest are known as forest resources. Forest res forests are in a way big repository of so many other things which we can include water bodies within the forest, all wildlife that we see in the forest, then all botanical products, all kinds of medicines that we can obtain from the forest and of course the timber which is the main product and then forage, all the leaves, the fruits and also biodiversity. Now there is no limit to these resources and how we carry on exploiting these resources to our own benefit will very much depend on the nature of the link we have with forests. Yeah, may I know what is this uh, concept of link? Uh, Archana, this is a very simple idea, it kind of refers to a ring or a loop in a chain that connects different parts of anything or it would connect various things together or it can connect things to people or people to people and that is what we call link. And in the context of forest resources, this link is very important. And why we need to very carefully look at this link is also from the point of view of the nature of this link. 
it can be either positive link or it can be also a negative link. Now, as long as this refers to positive relationship, what we find that there is a whole lot of collaborative activities, whole lot of dependence of one on the other. Whereas the same relationship, if it becomes negative in nature, it gives rise to a lot of protests, movements, lot of uh, struggles and we have both types of relationships in the context of forest resources. Now may I ask you another question, One, uh, that when we are talking about forest resources and the link with people, then who are these people we are talking about? Basically, if you look at it uh, the way I said in, right in the beginning, in this context we include all kinds of people, we include in this the common people and also those who live in and around forests and another set of people, those who are responsible for development, for preservation of forest resources. And when we say common people, what do we mean by common people? Common people, you and I, those who live in urban areas, those who live in rural areas, and in one way or the other, directly or indirectly, use forest resources. You would be surprised. The books that you read, the paper in these books, that comes from the forests. Similarly, the ink, it comes from the forest, the dye. Of course, we have many alternatives to these resources which are synthetic and uh, now with the progress of science, there are these uh, alternatives also available and that is a good thing in the sense that then we are not solely dependent on forest resources and we can allow some of these resources to remain there and to be preserved. So in that sense I see no problem but what happens is that I find most of the time whether in our kitchens or with in our uh, work situation or even in the world of entertainment all over there is a whole plethora of forest products that we keep using. So we are basically including everybody. But let me say that in terms of uh, today's discussion, our focus is on those who live in and around forests. And uh, this link, it used to be described as a symbiotic relationship. By symbiotic relationship, we mean that one organism depends on the other for its survival. Or in other words, we can say that both look after each other. Because if one doesn't survive, the other cannot. This kind of relationship had gone on for a long time. But the fact of the matter is that today, there is erosion in this symbiotic relationship for many reasons. And these reasons can be termed uh, as a rise in population, pressure on land, and also our uh, changing lifestyles. So all that has made this relationship not exactly as it used to be. That was a positive relationship. And now, with the erosion of that symbiotic relationship, there is an element of opposition, conflict. And that is something which we have to deal with. And w more and more, the way we have uh, the pattern of development we have, not only in India, all over the world, that has come in the way of this particular happy relationship. What has happened is that now we want much more benefit from development for certain sections of people with the result what happens that some sections 
have to sacrifice. They have to sacrifice their land, their habitat, their way of living in order to make way for these development projects. And obviously those who have to sacrifice have to then come in conflict. So that is something that we need to look at. Uh, Ekri, uh, I was just thinking that uh, when we you were talking about the symbiotic relationship, we have a video film on uh, Janu Kurba tribes in Karnataka and there how the forest people survive uh, for uh, many products in the forest, that is shown very clearly. But before showing that uh, clip, I would uh, like to ask you another question which is coming to my mind just now. that. Uh, when we are talking about development of the forest, is it opposed to the um, uh, survival and sustenance of the people who are living in the forest or is it different from their development? Yes, Ajna, this is one of those very contentious issues. Ideally, development should not be in conflict. It should not be opposed to any section of society. Mm -hmm. Development has to give its fruit to everybody, to all. But what has happened is that since some people are asked to make way for different development schemes like dams, hydroelectric plants, even uh, roads and transport, rapid transport system. So whoever comes in the way is asked to move out. And this moving out does not mean like it has meant, for example, in China. In China recently, they have uh, completed a huge, perhaps the largest dam in the world, uh, three gorges. And in that, one million people were displaced and all those one million for the next 20 years have been resettled with the result that in the next 20 years any of those 1 million people have any complaint about their resettlement and rehabilitation, they can complain and it is the government responsibility to look after them. Now if we take that example at one end and we come back to our country where we have seen recently through the media the protest of displaced people in case of Narmada Dam. That for decades this issue has been going on and obviously it hasn't yet been settled properly. So this is where I would not like to see it that development is opposed to or in conflict with people. But since these people are in a way without much either financial or political power they, their interests are not protected by the government either. So in that sense, this link that we have been talking about does become biased against poor people or against those who have so far had this symbiotic relationship. And this is where I think you are absolutely right. We should have a little clipping from our uh, program, Simple Societies, where you can see how people are dependent for their living on collection of honey and uh, how they just Yes. An important exclusively male activity is the collection of honey. In fact, it is from this activity that the tribe derives its name. Jenu means honey and Kuruba denotes backward peoples. Honey collecting for the Jenu Kuruba is similar to hunting in other simple societies such as the Bushmen of the Kalahari Desert in Africa or the Tiwi of North Australia. The difference is that while animals obtained from hunting are used for consumption by the tribe, the Jainukuruba men barter the honey that they collect. 
But the dangers associated with honey collection and the accompanying folklore, religious beliefs and practices are comparable to those associated with hunting. Honey collecting is a true test of a Jainukuruba man's bravery and skill. He has no clothing to protect him from the bees and can only rely on smoke to drive them away. It is hardly surprising, therefore, that a favorite saying in the tribe is, the wife of a Jainukuruba is bound to become a widow. When a man and a woman want to get married, they elope into the forest and hide there in... Well, this is what you have just now seen, that how Jenu Koruba, the tribals, they extract honey from trees, and this is one of their main sustenance from the forest, and they are able to take this for themselves as well as for sale in the market. Now, this is where I would like to come to this uh, whole question of the nature and magnitude of this link between forest resources and the people. The myth, so to say, we had earlier that it is the extraction of forest resources by those living in and around forests is mainly responsible for the quantum of deforestation in our country. And before I entered this field of social and cultural forestry, I also believed the same thing. Now what has happened, recent research and recent researches have brought it out with facts and figures that in reality this is only a myth. The nature of this link is of two type. We can look at it from two angles. One is the direct use of forest resources by households. So it is at the level of individual households exploiting forest resources. 
and that includes the category of resources dealing with fuel wood, fodder, forage and also the inputs in agriculture and then the other angle of this relationship is that of income and employment which is indirect exploitation of forest resources. So if we come to the first type that is what you have just now seen that at a small scale a uh, small section of society the tribals and not also old tribals but some tribals they extract things like well in this case honey from the forest but this kind of activity to make it mainly responsible for the extent of deforestation which has taken place in our country is too far fetched is certainly not the case and in that sense we would say that it's uh, not only with regard to this particular case but if we consider each one of these categories like of fuel wood for example I can tell you with certainty on the basis of researches that the kind of fuel wood which is for household consumption collected from the forest is mainly dead wood and if you collect dead wood obviously you are not causing deforestation. Dead wood and then shrubs and dried uh, sort of uh, uh, branches of trees not only in forest but outside forest also is used as fuel wood and also such populations that live in and around forests and who need fuel wood and who do go to the forest they also have their own alternative sources of fuel wood like crop residue lot of crop residue after harvest is there for them to use as fuel wood and then also biomass dung which is very common in our part of the country in North India to use as fuel wood. So in order to sustain their need for fuel wood at the level that they have there are also these alternatives. So along with the alternatives the limited use of forest resources cannot be called as the main cause of deforestation. The picture, the image that is given of the head loaders mm. depleting the forest is certainly only a myth. And I think we can also argue in the same vein regarding the um, extraction of food from the forest. There is no doubt that the kind of food which is extracted from forest resources is in the case of people who live in and around forests is very crucial. Crucial in the sense that it comes very handy during the time of shortages. Shortages are caused by uh, depletion of the stored grain that they have and also the next harvesting season is far away. So during that period which is also known as period of hunger whatever can be extracted by way of fruit, by way of uh, vegetables, by way of leaves which can be eaten as vegetables and also energy foods. Energy foods meaning different kinds of nuts that you can get or wild food, tubers and roots that you can get from forests. They are basically very crucial inputs in the diet of these people there is no doubt but this is mainly also because of the fact that during these shortages the subsistence farmers are unable to buy food because they don't have enough cash. So we can see that there is this dependence during certain periods 
but I would say that as in the case of fuel wood, there are also alternatives and these alternatives which the farmers or subsistence farmers and people who live in an around forest have created for their food also, again dispel the myth that extraction by such people is the cause of deforestation. Mm. Can yes. I ask you something? Yes. It come, maybe I'm talking from a lay person's point of view. Uh, when I think about the people in, living in the forest who are dependent of, for certain uh, support from the forest, it comes to my mind what happens when their families expand, when they need to uh, do agriculture or get more food from the forests or from other sources, what do the people do and who are exactly responsible for the deforestation? Uh, the question, I will come uh, a little later to who are responsible for deforestation, but let us look at the people who certainly depend on forest resources and when there is expansion, what happens? It is a well known fact that the resource of land which is in limited uh, quantity uh, is both in terms of the size because the size of the family expands but the land remains the same in mm -hmm. size. So there is a reduction of the size in this sense and also the productivity of land mm -hmm. is also reduced because there are more pressures on land and in that sense what do these people do is the question and what our researches show that the kind of sustenance people were able to get from forests is no more tenable. The kind of, well, the fuel wood they were able to collect, the kind of food they were able to gather are no more available. A, B, the excess is not available in the sense that entry into forest is restricted. So in that sense, there is a big question, what do they do? And that is where we have this whole chain of migration people migrate to urban areas, they go and live in slums, they try and find different kinds of uh, cash earning jobs and they become wage labor. So mm -hmm. this is where we have the real problem that how to make the link or the dependence on forest resources sustainable and as I said earlier that since forest resources are renewable, it is possible to come to that state where there is a balance between the need and between the supply. But that can happen only if we are able to look carefully into the ways how we can preserve. The ways which were earlier there are no more a in existence and B, they may not be applicable. So there have to be found different ways of preserving the resources and also wisely utilizing them. Now I come back to your question which you asked, who are responsible? And certainly the myth that prevails mm -hmm. is that these people, the traditional exploiters so to say, of forest resources are responsible. The fact is that for them these resources no more exist and their excess is not possible. Excess is available to people, let me say to mafia. Mm. The commercial activity is controlled by people who have resources to manipulate the government machinery to their advantage and extract timber in huge quantity. Mm. So that is one main source I would put for deforestation. And then you can add on to a very limited extent exploitation of forest resources by people also. And this brings me to the next angle that I said that there are two angles, one is direct use at the level of household which is very limited. But 
the other use that is indirect use for income and employment and in that the way forest resources are extracted with absolutely no care for their preservation for their renewal this is just simple extraction and that is where i would say that all categories are responsible for deforestation including those who are living in and around the forest but the main players are still the national and also let me include the international actors who have come in the field of exploiting forest resources and making profits without at all investing any part of their profit into its renewal and maybe i can also come to the different categories as far as those in rural areas are concerned as we just talked about the pressure on land reduction in its size and in its productivity obviously not everybody can migrate and within the rural scenario to find ways of raising income being employed is to go back to forests and then come the head loaders who get lot of fuel wood from the forest not for household consumption but for taking it to the market to the towns where lpg or electricity which are the alternative sources of energy for cooking are not yet available and majority of people in smaller towns still use wood they are the ones who buy and this is what gives the sort of people you asked about mm -hmm. their income and their way to survive mm -hmm. and the figures tell me that maximum source of income in the category of non agriculture work in rural areas all over the world comes from forest resources so to that extent yes this is the large chunk of a reason for depletion of forest resources but at the same time i can you might ask me this hmm. question that how is this activity sustainable hmm. because if forests are disappearing hmm. you cannot sustain this kind of non agricultural activity in rural areas hmm. very truly so we cannot sustain it and these small scale enterprises are doomed for failure hmm. what is going to survive and is going to cause much more damage to whatever existing forests we have are basically the large players they are the ones who are also favored by the power that be by administrators they are the ones who are given license to collect tendupatta mm -hmm. for making beeris and similarly other forest resources then uh companies like balasha paper mills they are the ones mm. at a very large scale they exploit forest resources and also come the multinationals mm. if you born to nainital mm. as you have already yeah. done you must have noticed the factory big factory to exploit what the herbs mm. to make medicines and this is a multinational mm. now this is the kind of thing the scale at which they exploit local resources local labor without mm. giving it back an, yeah. anything mm. back that is what caused deforestation one thing i would like to know is that uh, you were sometime back talking about agriculture so uh, the use of uh, for the forest people how they use forest resources for agriculture could you please explain a little bit more on this yes in fact so this is the point that should have hmm. got a bit more attention hmm. 
uh, this is uh, very true you know this uh, livestock for example are central to agriculture activities and uh, for uh, keeping your livestock you need to feed cattle and for that you need green forage where do you get these green leaves from quite a bit of fodder is collected from forest green leaves as well as the fallen leaves they are collected for feeding animals but here again let me tell you of course uh, it is a fact that this is uh, done so the farmers have also the alternatives and their alternatives pertain to what we have on their own farms the trees they grow hmm. and also in almost all rural areas we have common land hmm. where there are yes. these uh, kind of uh, hmm. green sources and similarly they also need pastures the grazing land yeah. and many a time if the forest reserve is around a village mm -hmm. that is also used mm -hmm. by shepherds to take the cattle for mm -hmm. grazing and then small amount of timber is also needed to make agricultural implements mm -hmm. for uh, the hoe for plow you mm. need the wood mm. and all this is done mm. at the village level by village craftsmen exploiting mm. the local resources so all these agricultural implements as well as a crude type of uh, furniture mm. like cots benches mm. uh, are uh, manufactured by local craftsmen using forest timber and these are mainly the kind of agricultural inputs which mm. they get from the forest and they are uh, also some handicraft you would mm. have known about the baskets mm. and the mats and market for all these products is mm. mainly in rural areas of course some of the handicrafts they do make their way to ethnic markets in uh, urban areas but it's a, at a very limited scale usually all the inputs are consumed mm. in local or regional markets to the hearts the mm. big hearts they take their products and in that sense the remuneration or the uh, income that is derived is very limited all the same local needs are fulfilled and from that point of view the concept of community forestry which has mm. not in fact been taken up in mm. india to any large extent mm. does provide something which is on a sustainable basis mm. the resource of limited type which is required for local needs for mm. agricultural inputs so this is where uh, one would uh, think that uh, the area of activity mm. lies and some kind of activism yes. can be used mm. to revive the kind of link that mm. is a doable feasible and it is not the romantic symbiotic mm -hmm. kind of relationship mm -hmm. but something which can be actually done uh, actually uh, now that uh, we are coming to the end of this topic i have one thing in mind that uh, when we are talking about the link between the forest resources and people uh, you talked about how f from the ages uh, they have been living within the forest and sustaining themselves with the forest products and little bit of agriculture with uh, simple technology and the rest but when we come to this uh, severe competition with the commercial groups the mnc's and others who are intruding into their rights then who will protect the right of the people there is it the ngos uh, as you said the activism is required some kind of community this thing is uh, required but this relationship between the 
people who are the, in the living in the forest the government and uh, the uh, kind of uh, intellectuals who who have their uh, positive uh, the thing in their minds how can the all these things be uh, worked out within this given setup yeah you have come to a very interesting triangle basically mm. you talk about ngos the activism then the administrative machinery mm. and people is very true there's no doubt about that that the stiff competition which uh, local actors face vis-a-vis the national and international players is no comparison and there is no possibility as things stand today for them to be able to survive but there are alternatives there are solutions to these uh, problems and in that sense right that uh, com- the concept of community forest or also uh, the administration which can look into because it's the administration which brings the national and international players into the arena to work out the terms and conditions of their entry which is in favor of local actors mm-hmm. what today exists is that in a very circumspect way the international agencies are able to mm-hmm. hire local labor at minimum possible rates mm-hmm. and this is exploitation of local resources local people with nobody to oversee whereas the situation can be turned around mm. where the local people yeah, are right. the masters they d- extract their local resources and they look after their lo- local resources at the same time and they set the price for it mm. so this is where mm-hmm. if possible again everyone has to be active the administrative mm-hmm. machinery and the activists yes. as well as the people people if they become aware the idea mm. of this uh, participatory mm, forest this management course right. was precisely right. this that the awareness may be generated on part of everybody to achieve these goals oh. thank you very much actually uh, i wanted to bring out this whole idea about how participatory research was uh, fruitful in the sense that it brought the link the people with the uh, forest uh, resources which they are uh, dependent on and the government machinery as well as the ngos who are active in this area of uh, protecting their rights today we have learned so much from uh, professor jain about the this whole concept of link what forest resources means how what are the interactions which are there with, between uh, all these uh, areas and how different agents are working in the forest uh, extraction of the forest resources so i hope uh, this has uh, given you a better idea about the ho- this topic and uh, i thank you for listening to us i thank professor shobita jain for coming here and giving her ideas on this topic thank, thank you. you very much thank you